And so finally, this is it. This is the new Land Rover Defender, which I would like to tell you more about than, whisper it, you will find anywhere else. In fact, there's only one thing I'm not going to be able to tell you about, and that is what it is like to drive on the road. But other than that, full technical details, a load of off-road challenges, uh, what it's like long distance off-road, what the cabin is like, what the architecture is like, the full technical lowdown. Stay tuned. So first things first, what is it? Well, it's a five metre long unitary body 4x4. It sits on Land Rover's D7X platform. Now Land Rover uses the term D7 a lot for everything between a Jaguar XE and the full fat Range Rover. It's an aluminium architecture with various derivatives and D7X is the most rugged. This is it then. So underneath the front is a steel subframe and underneath the rear is a steel subframe. There is a longitudinal engine driving all four wheels, including a low ratio transfer case. This is the tallest current Land Rover. The body sits 20 millimeters higher than any other current model and in the body in white, which means not just the exterior panels, but all of the structure beneath too, none of them is common to any other Jaguar Land Rover vehicle. So the Defender is a bespoke car. So at the front there is short long arm suspension that is double wishbones to you and me and at the back and this is common to the D7 cars there is what they call an integral link which is basically multi-link with another thing another couple of links in here and there to increase lateral rigidity. It's a big car in this form, five door form arrives first, 110 because Land Rovers used to have a 110 inch wheelbase, they don't anymore, but it's basically five meters long, including that rear wheel, which is standard, and it is just over 2.1 meters wide. Now that makes it a wide vehicle. It's a big car at 2.1 meters wide. In the UK, that will be interesting in multi-story car parks. Elsewhere in the world, it won't matter to you quite so much, I suspect. Now the car you see here is a 2 litre diesel, Ingenium diesel, making 240 new metric horsepower, so that's what, 236, 237 brake. There is a lesser power 2 litre diesel, there is a 300 horsepower 2 litre petrol, there is a 400 horsepower 3 litre petrol. We will drive over the next couple of days, I will be in both this green one, which is a 240 PS diesel, you will also see a silver car, that's the 400 brake petrol. I'll spend a little bit of time in both. The 400 PS petrol is a mild hybrid. That's really mild hybrid. That's one of these ones that is basically a big stop start. It never drives on electric power alone, but it just assists things along until the car gets uh, wound up. Let's have a look inside because there are quite a lot of new features to go through. And so welcome to the inside of the new Defender, which has some old Defender cues you might notice so there's a grab handle here there's one on the other side and then there's this sort of wide slab of flatness now if you have been in an old defender that will be slightly familiar to you You know it's got the old grab handle here and an awful lot of storage space including some stuff behind this screen now what you might notice is that my arm is resting on a very high center console it's not a center console at all it is actually a jump seat as with Defenders of old, you can have three seats in the front. Now, this is not the world's largest jump seat. It's for kids, really, or you might use it, I suppose, for coming home from the pub. But that's about it. Long journeys are out. Or, if you don't want that, you can have a walk through to the rear of the cabin or various different centre consoles with loads of storage cubbies. One thing to note if you do get this seat, it has integral cup holders in the back. If you have leaked water or fizzy pop or whatever into one of them and then you put it up that leaks straight onto the back point of note but this is fundamentally an incredibly practical car so you get all of the space to stow things there you get a not bad glove box and door pockets and then there are power sockets everywhere so i've got a 12 volt here there's two usbs there there is a row of USBs and power sockets here, and then there are two in the boot. So I make that one, two, three, seven, nine at least, which is probably enough, isn't it, really? The driving position is good. I can see all of the bonnet. The windscreen is large and relatively upright, not as upright as an old Defender, fairly obviously. Uh, you can't have screens too upright these days because that limits the drag coefficient. The new Defenders is 0 0.38, which is not bad, too blocky, and you use too much fuel and you'll never get it through various regulations or you'll have to charge people a load of money to do it. So there's lots of sort of exposed structural or faux structural components too. So there are 
Torx head bolts which are exposed and this, this thing along the dash is supposed to look like part of the actual structure itself. That's mixed with newer tech, newer style, more refined touches like a completely new infotainment system which is all touchscreen. I know how some of you feel about touchscreens and I feel exactly the same way. They are not always the most straightforward things to operate especially when you're on the move because even if you're in an off-roader and you you know you, you can support your hand there sometimes your, your fingers are going all over the shop. However as touchscreens go it's pretty good. It's much better and I mean much better than any previous Jaguar Land Rover system which as you may know are not terribly good. This one is now I think actually pretty good. It seems pretty quick to respond. It has largely sensible things in largely sensible places but moreover it can do an awful lot. So it can do everything from deploying your tow bar, check surroundings before deploying and then once you put your trailer on you can check the bulbs without having to get out of the car, you can measure the load on the tow hook without having to get out of the car. That sort of thing is clever and it goes up to, you see how quickly that responds by me pressing the home button then an old JLR system would not do that and then just a little thing comes up and goes yeah tow bars now deployed it would get nowhere near that with an old system it wouldn't have a hope of keeping up but that sort of thing extends to weight sensing I understand don't exceed vehicle limits blah 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 so it's got the maximum weight depth this car is on air suspension which I will come to in a minute which can increase the weight depth sometimes if you think well I'm going to drive through something and you're not sure how deep it is you'd have to get out and poke it with a stick well this you can find out kind of before you, you know, kind of as you go to stop you getting wet feet. I should add, don't drive through flood water. It's not very clever. But anyway, I think that's a good idea. You know, you're there cruising through something you may have forded before. And if you're thinking, oh, is that a bit deeper than it used to be? Well, you can, you can find out. Anyway, let's start her up. That's quite quiet for a diesel, isn't it? That Ingenium diesel, Jaguar's Ingenium diesel, sometimes is louder than others, depending on the application. This one to me is pretty good. So that's the main panel. Now there is an additional panel between the dials as is the way on things. I do like this about Jaguar Land Rover and a few other manufacturers are starting to do it too, to be fair. If you don't wanna to have to go through the rigmarole of using the touchscreen or if it's something that is easier to forget about, at the moment, this is doing like communication. So backwards and forwards, telephone, so on and so forth. Push that middle button, these buttons change and it becomes something else and it can change things on here. It's quite a useful set of shortcuts. Not as comprehensive as the middle one, but it means I can just concentrate on driving. On which note, I think it is probably worth driving it and telling you what it is like. Now there will be some general off-roading and then there should be a series of off-road challenges and that will vary depending on uh, the weather as to how extreme or otherwise they will be. I'll hop in and out of the car. I may be hopping in and out of other different cars but by the end of it I hope to be able to give you a very good idea of exactly how capable the new Defender is. Now you will see some green cars in this video which have a two litre turbo diesel, this is one, and some silver cars which have a three litre V6 with 400 PS. There are other options too but the 400 horsepower V6 is the most powerful and this D240 will I suspect certainly in the UK be the most common. Five door Defender prices start in Britain at £45,000 but the cars you're looking at here cost rather a lot more than that. The D240 is specced up to the mid £60,000 mark and the silver P400 is more like eighty to 85000 and it's possible if you try to spend £100,000 on a new Defender. This is now a premium vehicle. They all drive through an eight speed fully automatic ZF gearbox there's no manual option at the moment I doubt there will be at all and because of the nature of this platform they drive through to all four wheels via an electronically controlled center differential and an electronically controlled rear differential this is not a car that you can self choose to lock the diffs in the way that you can in say a Jeep Wrangler or a Mercedes G-Class as so the car the cars we're running here have got uh, Wrangler Duratrack tyres which have got reinforced sidewalls which are not standard tyre but you can get them 
as an option. Um, these are running lower tyre pressures here, just on the limit of the tyre pressure monitoring system, which of course all cars do have these days. But because it's an off-roader, there is a standard spare tyre, which is good. Now, the nice thing is it's also easily accessible, which is also good. But what that does necessitate is a door that opens sideways because you can't have a rear tailgate that opens up if you've got a door on it. But while that doesn't necessarily keep the rain off you, while you're putting your wellies on, uh, I think on a proper off-roader, that is not a bad idea. Now, while I'm here, let me also show you underneath. So if you're following a Defender, what you may notice is the fact that it has independent rear suspension. So you can see the suspension arms uh, hanging lower, I suppose, than they would if it had a live axle where you would just have that diff in the middle. The diff would be a bit lower and then it would be straight across to the wheel. So it's a bit of a sort of ground clearance minefield this isn't it really you know those are closer to the ground than an axle would be but also you get more ground clearance in the middle which is maybe where you want it, it depends if you're in tyre tracks or whether you're crawling or whatever but we'll do some crawling a little bit later while I'm underneath there you can see an air spring um, depending on what I was doing you know air springs are great for comfort no doubt if I was going to spend a lot of time out here in the middle of nowhere I think uh, I'd maybe prefer coils just because they're a more rugged thing and if I got a puncture in an air spring I might be looking around and thinking you know what it's quite a long way back to civilization. What you do get on the Defender is Land Rover's terrain response system and as well as being able to choose your own drive mode you can also select different modes so if you select rock crawl it makes the throttle pedal quite long so that you can more easily creep over rocks without getting jittery on the throttle, whereas if you choose sand mode, almost the opposite is true. You get loads of throttle response so that you can keep the power on through sand well, to keep the tyres spinning and keep the momentum. And that'll also slacken off the stability control, whereas in rock call it'll try and really keep wheel spin to a minimum by locking up the diffs very, very quickly and so on and so forth. The Defender is trying to help you out and make your time off-roading easier. It doesn't leave you to your own devices. It doesn't leave you to think, well, I should probably lock the disc for this. It does have a low ratio transfer case, but I think that tells you something about how the new Defender is trying to go about being an off-roader. It is incredibly capable. Let me show you just how capable and talk you through some of its off-road numbers. Right, I've hopped out, so I think what it's worth doing is talking you through some of the stats. We'll pop them up on the uh, screen against the wrangle as well, but it'll be interesting to see. In fact, the approach angle on this car is 38 degrees. Breakover angle is 28 degrees on this long wheelbase one. If you get a 90 as a shorter wheelbase by about 500 mil, this car's got just over three meter wheelbase, which is longer even than a Discovery 5. And then the approach angle is actually more than 40 degrees. It's about 41 degrees in this car, which has a three meter wheelbase. We stick the air springs on their high setting. You get 291 millimeters of ground clearance, which is pretty good going. Of course, what you can do with a Wrangler, because it's got a live front and rear axle, is you can stick a lift kit on it, which is not something you can do to the Defender. Axle articulation then is 500 mil, and that is pretty much where it will stay. But I think these cars, although the Defender is very capable off-road, incredibly capable off-road, is in a slightly different market to the Wrangler and intended to be better on road too, although more on that another time. What's interesting through here is we've got a guide, but actually inside the Defender you can pull up on screen a view of effectively through the bonnet so it's called like a it's called clear view i think it's like a virtual bonnet or you, or you can have a thing where it shows you via mirrors mount uh, by, via cameras mounted on the mirrors it shows you whether you are about to clear or not the rocks that you're around which is interesting isn't it, it takes some of the difficulty away from off-roading it actually makes off-roading easier so ditto the weight depth measurement it's showing so you can sit in the cabin it shows you how much water you're wading through it takes some of the harshness and difficulty away from off-roading. For some people, 
that's the whole point of off-roading. So what's also interesting about these cars is you see these panels at the back here and down the side. If you take the panels off of, if you give something a clout on a Range Rover Sport, you are faced with a very large bill. If you give one of these panels a clout, actually you can just take them off and replace them quite cheaply. And these on the back, two very rugged tow hooks, they can tow six tons each on those. This whole chassis apparently can take a seven ton vertical load. But there may be those among you, and I'm thinking those where the Jeep Wrangler sells very well in particular, who are thinking, well, can an independent suspension car really be rugged enough to be a true off-roader? Well, let's talk you through some other numbers. This is a much bigger car than the old Defenders. It's five meters long, two meters wide. And yes, it's an aluminum structure, but it does have a 3.5 ton towing limit in Europe. That's 3.7 tons in the US where you seem to have a bit more of a liberal attitude to towing heavy things than we do in the UK. The snatch points front and rear, ones on the front are, are fairly low, but Land Rover advises you put a strap on them before you go off-roading in case you're wading so that you don't have to go into the mud to try and find it anyway. And they can't be any higher because of pedestrian impact regulations. And although it isn't a separate ladder chassis and body, and although the chassis is predominantly aluminium with those steel subframes front and rear, torsional rigidity is 29 kilonewton meters per degree, so it's stiff. It's a stiff shell. The load capacity in the back is 900 kilos, and that's why there'll be a commercial version of both this five-door and the three-door later. What I don't think there'll be, because I think you'll lose too much rigidity, and also because that load capacity isn't over a tonne, is see a pickup version of this car. I think that market, the double cab pickup market, has probably gone for Land Rover. They've been out of it, apart from to some fairly wealthy small businesses and farmers in the UK. I think that market left them a long time ago and I don't think they'll be back to it. And a unitary body is intrinsically, it's not as flexible, by which I mean it's not as adaptable as a separate chassis, so you won't have power companies sticking cranes on the back of one of these because it's just not that kind of vehicle anymore. Well, what's it like to drive? Well, I have a really comfortable driving position in here. Big seats, an easy, straight driving position with a, with a large wheel, light steering, which you can make slightly heavier if you mess around with the terrain response control, but I fairly like the light steering. Actually, it's, it's very responsive, and if you're spending serious amounts of time at the wheel of this car in conditions that are not ideal and I don't necessarily mean you know extreme off-road but if you're spending a lot of time on gravel tracks or you know mooching around some land or on and off of work sites and things like that the fact that this car makes life easy makes it less tiring it's because there's less fatigue if you and if you can get out at the end of the day if you're spending a long time in one of these is your work vehicle you get out at the end of the day 20% less fatigued because the steering's, the steering's easy, off-road it's so capable and it helps you out so much with the terrain response system and the camera system and the towing system that tells you how much load you've got on the back and checks the bulbs for you so you don't have to get out into the cold and walk around the trailer and things like that. This is the kind of vehicle that makes life and doing extreme things, not as extreme as this, but just doing tiresome daily things, it makes life easier. I don't think that has come at the expense of its outright off-road ability or credentials. So I don't want to fudge a verdict. I spent 400 miles and three days in this car, all on, all on really tough terrain, and I come away massively impressed. But before we say whether it's the first, second, third or fourth best car in its class, I do want to get it in the UK. I do want to get it on tarmac. And I do want to get it against its rivals, ideally, at a more palatable price than this initial high-spec one. But until then, know this is a thoroughly capable and thoroughly likeable car, and Land Rover have done a bang-up job with it. So thanks for joining us. Come back again when we have it against its rivals in the UK. Oh, quiet. In the meantime, thanks for supporting the channel. Really appreciate it. You can find us here on YouTube all the time, at autocar.co.uk all the time, and in magazines, in the magazine, every Wednesday. Thank you.